Let me real quick um, introduce um, our guest to you. It's amazing, isn't it, Pat? Uh, on Monday, on Monday, we have almost a, a global senior pastor with us like Brian Houston, a guy who has a legacy uh, of investment into the kingdom. Um, I told you that Brian Houston started in a tiny little living room, and today their church has over 100,000 people a Sunday coming to all their different expressions. And, um, and you see a man like that who is 61 years old, faithful in the kingdom. And, and you see a Louis Giglio in his mid-50s who is being used by God in a great way. And, and sometimes who we have before us is someone who has is, who is literally been a pioneer and has tread the way for a long, long time. And then sometimes we have what, what we would consider a, a new face, a, a new voice, right, in the wilderness. And, um, and that, that's our guest today. Very fast, right off the shoot, the very first video that Jeff, uh, uh, you know, Jefferson Bathke put out had 30 million people view his spoken word. And uh, since then, over 60 million people have watched uh, so many of his different uh, videos that he's posted all over the world. He's a author of two books. Uh, today at 4 o'clock, I'll tell you more about that. You'll have a chance to meet him uh, at a meet and greet and, and get a book if you want and get that signed. But uh, what I love about this, this young man is that um, there's a humility about him, a teachability about him, and, and an approachability about him that is contagious. And um, I really, really just want to say this to you. Look at me. Shh, listen to me. I, I really feel like today, I really feel like today God has a word for you that is more than just something He wants you to take notes on, but that He wants you to um, apply to your life. Uh, Jefferson was sharing a little bit about what God's put on His heart for us this morning, and as he was just giving us the two-minute version of it in the green room a little while ago, we all were nodding our heads like, that is so timely for us. But um, Jefferson, we love you. Uh, this is your third time to be here, and it won't be the last. Uh, brother, we, we are um, excited about sitting under your teaching. Can we put our hands together? Come on, everybody, for Jefferson Becky. How's it going? You guys doing good? Awesome. Um, I am so excited to be here. Like you said, this is my third time. Um, and you guys are just a very special place. I really, really uh, love you guys. I'm really thankful for you guys. I feel like you guys are an encouragement to me when I talk to you guys on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat. Shout out to Snapchat. Um, and I just really, really do appreciate you guys. And so this is a huge blessing to me to be here. And I just want you guys to know, you guys are a part of a community that's changing the world. And so don't forsake that and don't uh, miss that. You guys are a part of a community that's changing the world. And I also just want to thank everyone on staff here at Liberty, everyone I've met, Pastor David obviously, has been a huge blessing to me. And I want a quick anecdote, a couple years ago, he was in town where, uh, he was speaking in town where I was from, uh, kind of near Seattle. And I remember, shout out, and I remember, um, the Seahawks are terrible this year, but it's okay. I remember that uh, hitting up David on DM or something like that and basically just saying, hey, can we just meet? Because I mean, I was 23, 24 at the time a couple years ago. I got thrust into this stuff, didn't really know what I was doing. And with his platform and what he does uh, and what he was doing at the time, it was just, I was blown away that he gave me his time. We met at Red Robin, unlimited fries, you have to, right? Um, and I remember him scribbling stuff on a napkin that I still remember to this day. So I just want to say thank you big time. I really appreciate you, and you guys have an amazing leader here. So please know that. Please know that. Um, and it just meant a lot that he was willing to, uh, like I said, give his time and his energy to me. And if you have your Bibles, Genesis 2, um, or you can track on your app or on your phone, that's where I'm going to be reading out of this morning, and then we'll kind of go a few other places after that. And um, I'm really excited to be here uh, for actually another reason, too. I saw that Hillsong was here on Monday, so I'm standing on the same stage as Hillsong. Is that not awesome, right? I, still, I can feel the glory, like, emanating, right? <laughs> Right? Um, yeah, shout out to uh, Oceans, right? Best song ever. It's been making uh, Christian girls cry since 2013. But, um, <laughs> right? Uh, but no, excited to be with you guys. Genesis 2, and I want to talk about one thing. If you take away one thing, if you take away one word from this talk, I want it to be the concept or the idea or the theme of healing, right? Healing or kind of wholeness or fullness in Jesus. Because if I'm honest, I didn't hear that message much. I started following Jesus in 19, freshman year of college, and I didn't hear that message much when I needed it the most, right? They say, sociologically speaking, who you become from 18 to 22 is actually who you become for the rest of your life, most likely. Meaning the foundations you set, the values you have, that person you become in those four years kind of sets your trajectory. And I think a lot of times we try to skate through without actually digging 
without actually trying to look at our baggage, our wounds, and things that's happened to us, the shame, the guilt, the hurt, the pain, not realizing that this is actually the time to do that because we have hopefully 50, 60 years ahead of us, Lord willing, that we can set that foundation now. And so that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about healing. And if you have your Bibles, I, I, I want to start in Genesis 2 because I think to understand how we can find healing, I think we have to understand where it went wrong. Does that make sense? I think we have to understand the beginning, what God was doing, and then where it went wrong. So if you have your Bible, Genesis 2, look down to verse 15, and we'll just read a couple verses right there. It says this, it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Now that's really interesting. Why? Because that means from the very beginning we have been given a job, does it not? Right? If you were to think about the idealistic Christian life, what is it usually? Usually it's listening to Chris Tomlin all day and praying in your closet, right? Basically it's like this private, and Chris Tomlin's amazing by the way, right? But it's, it's privately spiritual, meaning we think that if it's just us at the throne of God praying all the time, that is the idea of what it means to be a Christian. That's actually the idea of what it means to be an angel. You ever thought about that? Every time an angel shows up, they're interceding, worshiping, and praying at the throne of God. Humans were actually given a job to do. Humans are actually given a job to do, meaning when you do your job right as an image bearer of God, that's what it means to be fully human and that's what it means to walk with the Lord. Obviously in that, spiritual you know, prayer and intercession is a huge part of that. But what I'm saying is we've been commissioned with a job, we have to not forsake that. We are put in the garden to work it and to keep it, to co create, cultivate, stuff of that nature. Verse 16, and then the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. Now this is one of my favorite passages for a few reasons. I think this is kind of where the chasm started. This is where the story started to get really interesting. Well obviously Genesis 1 is interesting, it's inspired, you know what I mean. Genesis 2.16, right? You see in this that the Lord God gives a command. And he says, you can eat of the, tr don't eat, you can eat of everything, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I grew up in the church context where I knew this story, I knew that command, but what it really meant, or what I thought it, like I thought it was a weird arbitrary command. Anyone else? Right? And what I mean by that is like the logical question I had when I was like 12 in Sunday school was like, if God didn't want us to touch it, then what? Why is it there? Right? You guys tracking with me? Right? So I always thought it was kind of this eternal cat and mouse game, right? Like God's just kind of saying, well, let's see how long they last. And if you know the story, they last like four seconds. That should give us encouragement. Anyone else? Right? We are not the only ones that like God says don't, and we do it like within two seconds. But you see that it's not an arbitrary command. I think it's actually a call to intimacy or a call to wholeness or fullness that, that we actually see in the beginning. Why? Because it gets down to the name of the tree. The tree is the knowledge. When you eat of that tree, you get the knowledge of what? Good and evil. You guys, you, guys, you guys awake with me? You guys here? 10, 10, 30 a.m., are you with me? Okay, just making sure. Some of you riding the struggle bus still slept in. Okay. Um, <laughs> the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Um, when you eat of that tree, you get the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Now, not a trick question. If they don't eat of that tree, if they actually obey God, if they listen to his command, and they do not eat of that tree, what do they not have? The knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Now, track with me. They, a verse before, they were just given a job. Right? A verse before they were just given a job. Now last time I checked, when you have a job to basically like go and create and cultivate the whole earth, you probably need to know what's right and wrong. Amen? Right? You probably need to know and have knowledge of something, right? But might it be that God's actually saying if you don't eat of that tree, you won't have knowledge of good and evil and know yourself, but you will find it where? In Him, right? In God, in Jesus. Which if you're in any Christian setting and a question happens, just say, God, you'll probably be right, okay? You'll be, you'll be fine, right? And if you say it and you're wrong, you just be like, well, I'm more holy, I said Jesus. But um. Might it be that that command was actually God setting two paths that I think he's still setting to this day, right? You can be your own God, you can be your own king, you can think you know what's right and wrong, which all sin comes from that, does it not? Or you can lean on utter and full dependence on me, right? We have an 18-month-old daughter, Kinsley, and she's at the age right now, oh, shout out to Kinsley fans, did not know that, okay. Um, <laughs> whoa, um, that was awesome. She does have a Twitter, I made it. But um, <laughs> she's pretty funny too, I'm not going to lie, okay. Um, so, where was I? Oh yeah, so the tree of the knowledge of evil, might it be that God's actually out, calling us to intimacy? He said, you can do it yourself, you can be your own God, your own king, it won't end well, it'll breed death, which is exactly what he says, or you can lean on me, just like our, our daughter Kinsley, she's at the age still where she would not even be able to survive if she could not fully lean on her parents, right? Might that be a picture of what God wants from us, that every time we're, that he wants full and utter dependence from the beginning. So he sets out these two paths and said, are you going to lean on me, are you going to trust me to guide you with this mission to create and cultivate on this earth, or are you going to think that you can do it on your own, right? And that's still to this day the two paths he's laying out. Now we know the story, do they eat or do they not eat? 
right? They eat, right? And this is kind of like a Bible trivia fact, but it's really interesting. It actually specifically says that God kicks them out of a garden a certain direction. Does he know what direction he kicks them out? It's a famous Steinbeck novel, right? East, East of Eden, which I went to public school. I never read it. I heard about it. It sounds cool. But um, East of Eden, right? So then God kicks them out of the garden. After they make that choice, it breeds death. The curse is now on the world. Shalom is broken. And he says he kicks them out East of Eden. Now, why that's interesting is the one minute that happens right there, pop up almost every chapter or every other chapter in Genesis, right? Cain kills his brother Abel, and, it's Abel, and it says he actually gets uh, banished farther east into kind of no man's land, right? And then Lot departs from Abraham in that story, which is clearly a sign of disobedience, right? And it says he goes east. The peak picture of all human pride and sin, the Tower of Babel specifically says they migrated east, thinking they could do it on their own. It's as if Genesis is trying to say, when you make that claim, when you make that call that you can do it on your own, that you know what's right and wrong apart from God, it's kind of about this spiral downward. Going east represents spiraling downward of humanity, walking away from the garden, walking away from intimacy, walking away where you were actually created to walk with your creator, right? And if you know the story, right after Tower of Babel, we meet this man, Abram, who we kind of know as Abraham now, right? And he's even called the father of faith. Why? Because he's one of the first to actually live in full trust and obedience, which sounds like the commission in the garden with the tree, does it not? He's one of the first people. It says he gets called to an unknown place, and he says, yes. That sounds a lot like faith and dependency, does it not? Right? He doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know what God's doing. And even the promise he was given with children, it was all faith. He trusted. Now, it specifically says he goes a direction when he gets called to an unknown place. Does anyone know a direction? West, right? He is now going back towards the garden. He's going back towards walking with his creator, right? And I think that's a beautiful picture of what path are you on? Are you kind of going away from God, away from the garden, trusting him in dependency, going back towards the garden, walking with him in intimacy, right? And I mean, I can nerd out on this stuff all day. There's even a bunch more examples. There's, the last one I'll give you is um, when God's giving the mandates for how to build the temple, meaning make it look like this, look like this, look like this, build it this high, this wide, etc. He specifically gives the command to put the entrance of the temple on the east side of the temple, so when they're going in, they're going what direction? West, right? They're going back into that mini garden, which if you read the command of the text, it's basically, he's, they're commanded to put kind of uh, imagery of leaves and fruit and trees and all these different things that would have sounded awfully like the garden, would it have not? It's as if God's saying, I want to call you back into my presence. I want to call you into wholeness. I want to call you into fullness. The question is here today, what path are you on? Do you think you know what's right and wrong? Which, by the way, that can even mask itself as sometimes legalistic religion, can it not? I don't need Jesus. I don't actually need to know him. I just want all the right answers. I know what's right and wrong. I can do this on my own, right? So the path you have to ask is what direction are you going? What path are you on, right? And I think a real pivotal answer to what path we go on really even jumps back to the garden with God's first response to sin. Now think about this, I, I, I'm in seminary and I learned that one of my professors likes to say that whenever God or when something happens first in scripture, you kind of have to pay double attention. Meaning when it's the first question or the first thing or the, the first theme of, or the first text of a theme, whatever it is, he goes pay extra attention because the first time usually is setting a theme. It's usually saying this is a pattern that's going to play out over the narrative, right? Now, the first thing God ever does in response to sin, so sin just entered the world, they lasted four seconds, a couple verses, and they disobeyed, right? What's the first thing God does? Did God have every right to snap his fingers and just blow them off the planet, not to be morbid, but he did, right? He had every right to do that, because why? They disobeyed, right? Did he have every right to kind of uh, condemn them, say, what were you thinking? What are you doing? I just told you not to eat that. Are you stupid? Come on, what are you doing? Right? Did he do that? No. What did God do? What's God's very, 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 very most primal first response to sin entering the world? It's a question. Isn't that the kind of the weirdest thing, right? Am I the only one? Why is God asking a question weird? Because he's God. Are you tracking with me? Right? Like he doesn't ever need to know an answer to that question. But if you know the question, it's in saying, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? So if God doesn't need an actual answer to that question, might he be saying something else? Might God, from the very beginning of time, when sin and curse and brokenness and the shalom that breaks enters into the world, might it be that God is saying, where are you? You don't have to hide anymore. Where is my son? Where is my daughter? Notice too in the text, he goes walking looking for them. The very first response to sin is God actually initiating, God pursuing, God coming after you, God going and looking for Adam and Eve, right? Where is my son? Where is my daughter? I think he's still asking that question to this day, is he not? 
When will they come out of hiding? Where is my son? Where is my daughter? He finds Adam and Eve, and they say, we hid because we are naked. And then he asks what? He asks a second question. He says, who told you you were naked? And again, I don't think God's actually needing an answer to that question. I think it might be the same thing of him beckoning in his own heart, saying, who told you you weren't good enough? Who told you you were condemned? Who told you you had to hide? Because that was not the voice from the beginning in the garden saying, you are mine. You are the beloved. You are an image bearer of God. That is the good news, that God's coming after you, and his voice over you is truth. His voice over you is life. His voice over you is one calling you out of hiding, okay? I know in college specifically, I struggled with kind of what voices are gods, I kind of have all these things in my head, or maybe I'm just ADHD and I think too much, I don't know, right? But I, I would kind of always struggle with, well, what, how do I know that it's God's voice? And obviously you have to test it with Scripture, right? But also at the same time, I think that this is a good barometer. If it's the voice calling you out of hiding, out of, into vulnerability, into intimacy, that's probably His, right? If it's the voice sending you into isolation, sending you into con condemnation, sending you into being all by yourself and no one knows your hurts, your fa failures, your shame, and your guilt, definitely not God's voice. Because that's not what we see in Scripture. That's not the voice we see from Himself. The voice is, where are you? You can come out of hiding. So that's my challenge to you today, is have you, are you guys in hiding? Is there things in your life that you're just on the treadmill of life trying to act like you have it together, which sometimes that actually is even doubly worse at a Christian university, is it not? Should be the place of vulnerability and intimacy. Sometimes the culture is created, which is not created from the leadership here at all. I know these people, and they long for this, but sometimes we just buy this lie that just comes from kind of nowhere of, oh my goodness, I have to be really squeaky clean, right? I can't act like I'm messed up. I can't act like I have anything wrong with me. I can't be honest because they might not like me anymore. They might not accept me anymore. No, no, no. If you listen to the true voice of God, it's calling you out of hiding. And if these are followers of Jesus in the room, then they will do the same thing, will they not? And so this is a place of community, of vulnerability, of intimacy. And so God's calling us out of hiding. And then if you trace that all the way down to Malachi, right? So now we get all the way to the whole Old Testament, it becomes this battle. This battle of where are you? He's saying that to Israel. He's saying that to his people. He wants to create a people to put the world back together, but they keep going into hiding. They keep rebelling. They keep kind of thinking they can do it on their own. They keep worshiping false gods. They keep worshiping idols, and God never gives up. Amen? He keeps relentlessly pursuing them, pursuing them, going and looking for them, saying, where are you? He keeps looking and looking and looking. But we see that the Old Testament does not end in its own story, meaning it does not have its own conclusion. It points to something it cannot deliver. We start seeing that some Something bigger has to happen. Something better has to happen. The curse is so much deeper and bigger than we ever could have imagined. It cannot be fixed by simply doing a bunch of things. Something has to happen, right? And that's when we get to the person and work of Jesus. And I love John, how John puts it. He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, echoing Genesis, right? Saying the same God from the very beginning has now come, skip down a few verses, John 1, 14, that Word has now become flesh and dwelt among among us. That's beautiful news, is it not? The best part about John 1.14, which, by the way, do we, we really don't, I think that's a huge potent verse, but we really only use it for Christmas, do we not? Like the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, we sip on hot cocoa and listen to Kenny G, right? Which I probably shouldn't have just told you guys I listened to Kenny G. But anyways, um, I mean that's sacks though, can we be honest? For reals. Okay. Um, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word in Greek, dwelt, literally means tabernacled. The Word became flesh and pitched His tent on our place, on our turf, in our life, in our backyard. He tabernacled among us. God Himself is now walking among us. That sounds like He's still asking the same question, but even going further. Is He not, where are you? I'm going to come find you. Where are you? I'm going to put on flesh myself and do whatever it takes to actually come find my people. Right? And one of the craziest things you see about Jesus is everything changes when He shows up. Everything changes. Here, here's, here's just like a little quick question. When you look at the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, outside of a few exceptions, every time something unclean comes in contact with something clean, who wins? Anyone? Bible students? Okay. Unclean. Every single time, right? Meaning if there's an unclean Israelite and they come in contact with something, I mean a clean Israelite, and they come in contact with something unclean, they get infected. Do they not? They become unclean every single time, outside of a few exceptions there are, which I think is just a foreshadowing of atonement, God, Jesus in the future, right? But what we see is that every single time something's unclean comes in contact with something clean, it infects the clean, right? But what changes is when Jesus shows up, does that not flip? 
Have you ever thought about that? When Jesus shows up, it is radically different. When Jesus shows up, now everything unclean that con- comes in contact with Jesus, they themselves, that unclean thing becomes clean simply by touching him. That's the explosive healing and cleaning power that Jesus has. I don't think we lean into that enough. I don't think we trust in that enough, that Jesus actually makes us clean, right? I think a lot of times we buy the lie that like, oh, I'm too unclean or I'm, I've done too much bad stuff or, or you know, I'm going to infect Jesus per se. We don't think about it like that, but we think we can't come to him because we're too dirty, right? Not understanding that there's not one instance in the New Testament where someone reaches out and touches Jesus when they're unclean that they don't become clean instantly. Instantly. That is the beautiful good news about Jesus is when you reach out and touch him, you become clean, right? There's even a scene where literally a a girl, a lady reaches out and touches his clothes, right? Like those are some pretty holy clothes, would you agree? Right? And she becomes clean. That's not H&M, amen? Okay. But she becomes clean by touching his cloak, right? And he even makes a comment of saying that I felt the power come out within me, right? It's so explosive, it's so cataclysmic that he actually feels it flow out from from him. The question is, have you reached out and touched Jesus? Or the really dark, hard parts in your heart, in your life, in your past, have you let Jesus reach in and touch those? That's another way to ask it. Have you let Jesus clean you? Have you come to him with every area of your heart in full vulnerability? Hard to say that word. Okay. In intimacy and let him clean you. There's an explosive cleaning power about Jesus that I think we don't take advantage of. You see that it's this bomb that goes off and the the death and resurrection of Jesus that starts emanating outward. It's just cleaning people. Anyone that comes under the reign and rule of Jesus, they become clean, whole, healed, renewed. The question is, have you really done that with the hard parts, the bad parts? Have you really found that healing, right, in the person and work of Jesus? Now, question, Jesus makes you clean, does he not? Now, what's something that usually needs cleaning, right? When you go, when when, when you have a wound and you go to the doctor, what's the first thing they do? They clean it, right? Do they not? They usually clean it, they, they take away out all the bad stuff. Sometimes it hurts, sometimes it's painful, right? But they clean it. Why? Because our wounds need cleaning. Our wounds need healing, okay? And I don't think we take our wounds to Jesus enough. We let them fester. Because think about it, like a wound, a physical wound actually, if it's bad enough, what happens? It gets infected, right? And not to be morbid, you could actually die if it's bad enough. People die from infections, right? But yet we think if we can just cover it, hide it, it's somehow going to get better. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And spiritually, we're no different, right? We have these wounds that people touch and they're sensitive and we cringe and we pull back and we say, no, I don't want you to see that. We cover it up with legalistic religion or doing all these different things or or, or we work a ton or we do all these things to just kind of hide the true parts that actually need healing in us, do we not? Because let's be honest, in this, a room this size, I guarantee you there's some real, real hard stuff in this room. Probably people don't say it too much at Christian universities, but I guarantee you there's dozens if not hundreds of people who have had abortions in this room. I know there's probably people, according to stats, thousands sexually abused. You know by the time you get out of college, the stat in America is one in three girls, one in six guys have been sexually abused in some way. That means according to this room, thousands. I bet you can't look left or right and barely name one person. Why? Because we hide, right? I wouldn't be surprised if there's people in this room that are cutting. I wouldn't be surprised if people in this room that are dealing with just insane, serious shame and guilt from past decisions, or something that even someone done against you that was an evil, grievous sin. I guarantee you in this room there's some real hard things. And the way to ask yourself what a wound is, is what part in your heart or in your life when people get close you cringe. When people get too close, it's sensitive. You never talk about, you never bring up, you spend all your energy and time and religious obedience to hide. What would that be? That's probably the place that actually needs the healing the most, is it not? And so you have to ask yourself, what is that place? But no matter how dark it is, no matter how big it is, no matter how much you feel the weight of that shame and that guilt, the truth is Jesus can clean it. Jesus can heal it. And that's the best, most beautiful news in the world is that you can take those wounds to Jesus, no matter what they are. Reach out and touch him. He reaches out and touches you, and they become healed. Now, when a wound becomes healed, what's it become? A scar, right? It becomes a scar. Now, think about how different a wound is from a scar. You ever thought about that? So a wound hurts. A wound is sensitive. A wound you hide. A wound can get infected. A scar, last time I checked, doesn't hurt anymore, does it? 
A scar doesn't hurt, right? You don't hide a scar usually anymore, right? And what does a scar do? A scar tells a story, right? Maybe that's just a dude thing, I guess, right? But it's like, you know, you got a scar, you're like, hey, let me tell you. Two hours later, you're like, bro, stop. Okay, I'm done, right? A scar tells a story. Have you let Jesus take your wounds? Have you brought those to him in the death and resurrection? Because by the way, even Jesus himself had wounds, put them into the grave, and actually when he resurrects, what do they become? Scars, right? They become scars himself. Jesus can identify, Jesus knows, right? When you take your wounds to him and you let them clean, you let him clean them, heal them, you then turns into a scar, right? And, I, and scars tell a story, right? Like I have a few scars. I have a little tiny scar on my upper lip. Can't really see it much, but it's, uh, and I don't remember it because I was like 12 or 13 months old. My mom tells me the story. Apparently, I thought it would be a good idea to eat the dog's food. Um, the dog didn't think that was a good idea, if you're tracking with me. So, uh, you know, dog one, Jeff zero, bit right in the face. Okay. Um, I have a huge scar on my shoulder. I'm kind of like bionicle. I have two metal, two titanium plates and ten screws through my shoulder. When I was playing baseball in high school, I kind of just dove really awkwardly and landed like with a lot of pressure. I kind of landed like this, and it just blew up my shoulder, you know, just kind of like dislocated, sticking out, and that was probably TMI actually, but you know what I mean. Okay. But now I have a scar, right? But the truth of the matter is with all these things, I'm not afraid to tell you that story. Why? Because it's been healed. Because it's been healed. The question is, have you let Jesus heal your wounds and make them scars, right? Is that not kind of just the, the, what it really means to, uh, the big word we use in Christianity is witness to other people? Is telling people about your scars, isn't that basically like the base fundamental definition of what it means to witness? You're basically just going around and saying, look what Jesus did, he can do it for you too. Look what Jesus healed, look how good he is, look where I came from, and look what he has done for me, you can have that too. That's basically the job of telling people about Jesus, right? So the question is, have you brought your wounds to Jesus, and have you let him turn them into scars? He can heal you, he truthfully can. The resurrection is the power that can change your life and give you that healing you so desperately need. The question is, have you done it? And by the way, realize too that actually it's not just about you, right? Like when you find, like, like if that's what it means to tell other people about Jesus, is tell people where you've been healed and how good he is, right? then might it be that if you're actually hiding your wound and not taking care of it and it's getting infected, you're actually keeping other people from hearing about Jesus? Because God can't turn your story around and send you out until you've actually found the healing in that place. So it's not even just costing you joy, costing you fulfillment, costing you wholeness. You're actually preventing other people from finding Jesus, right? And usually if you found it in this room, you usually know the very place you found healing becomes what? The very place you usually start telling other people about most. It kind of becomes your platform or your ministry or the place where you feel like you can really enter into a conversation, right, is with the very same people who can identify. So might it be that you find healing, not just for your own expense, but because there's actually other people that need to hear that good news. They need to actually hear that good news. I'll, um, for time's sake, I'll end with one story. It comes from the Bible, Luke 24, and this is one of my favorite stories because I think we can talk about all this, and then the hard part can be sometimes we still naturally think uh, that the way to find that healing is just to know a bunch more facts, to just study theology more, or just to learn my Bible more in the factual sense or mental ascent way. No, no, no. All that is good, but it's actually by leaning and sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's where you find healing, through another person. And so I want to show a story that I think highlights that, and like I said, I'll summarize for time's sake. Luke 24, story of the road to Emmaus. One of my favorite stories, because it's literally one of the weirdest stories in Scripture. You'll see why in a second. Now, if you know the story, Jesus is resurrected. Jesus has come out of the grave, right, glorified body, and, and he comes out. He sees two guys, and he, they kind of look bummed out, right? And so Jesus goes, goes next to them, and he basically asks them, why are they bummed, right? That's my translation, why are they sad, right? Uh, um, and they basically, uh, they, they don't know it's Jesus, it says. It specifically says they don't recognize him. So they look at him, and they rebuke Jesus, which is not a good idea, amen? Okay, just checking, okay. Um, they rebuke Jesus, and basically say, like, are you, they're kind of sarcastic, like, are you kidding? Like, did you not hear what just happened a couple days ago? Like, have you been paying attention? Right? Because it was a public spectacle that Jesus was crucified under Roman rule, right? And to them, they were devastated because they just wasted the last three years of their life, they thought, right? Because in the first century, no one, a crucified Messiah was no Messiah at all in the first century. No one had any framework or context for that, which shows you how upside down the cross is, right? No one had a context for that. So when they saw Jesus, the minute they saw him on the cross, they said, we just wasted the last three years of our life. We've got to find a new guy. 
So they basically rebuke Jesus by telling him those things. And if you know the story, what's really crazy, what does Jesus do? Jesus actually rebukes them back, which is usually a good idea, right? And he actually says, oh, foolish ones, which none of us ever want to hear, but we probably do sometimes. Um, oh, foolish ones. And the exact quote is, he begin, and then the, the narrator says, he begins from the law. Narrator, it's like we're in like, um, okay, anyways. Um, Luke, um, he begins from the law to the prophets describing what must have happened of the Christ. So Jesus basically rebukes them back and basically goes from the law to the prophets, which by the way, that's a euphemism in Jewish culture for the whole Bible, okay? They didn't have the New Testament. Law is the first five books of the Bible. Outside of wisdom literature, it's all prophets basically after that. So he's basically saying from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, Jesus basically says, uh, are you guys idiots? Right? Again, that's my translation, but you know what I mean. Like, have you guys missed the point? What have you guys been reading this whole time, right? It says he begins from the law to the prophets describing what must have happened to the Christ, saying this was supposed to happen the whole time. This was supposed to happen the whole time. Now, can we just let that sink in for a second? Like, really, Jesus himself, there's only one verse on it, so I don't think we let it sink in. Jesus himself, in the flesh, resurrected body at that, is literally preaching and explaining every page of the Bible to two guys. Am I the only one that thinks if I was in that situation, my brain would fall out? Am I the only one? Right? Like, like, that's inception, is it not? Like, uppercase word explaining the lowercase word, are you with me? Right? Like, that's insane, right? Jesus himself basically goes page by page by page. Jesus almost basically becomes their personal, like, Beth Moore Bible study partner, does he not? Right? Like, he's just saying, fill in the blank, fill in the blank, here you go, right? Jesus becomes their Bible study, like they're doing devos together, okay? And Jesus is literally page by page saying, this was supposed to happen, this was supposed to happen. You would literally think that the heavens would open up and be like, ah, right? And they would just faint. Like that's just so insane that God himself is literally next to them saying, explaining every verse of the Bible. That's crazy. Now if you're familiar with the story, what happens? Does any of that happen? Do they go crazy? Do they faint? Does like the heavens open up with the angels singing? No. In fact, nothing happens. Zero, right? The next verse is like five hours later. It just doesn't even address it, right? So the next verse is like, it says later that day, they got to their house, they asked Jesus to stay for a meal, and this is where it gets crazy. It says Jesus then says yes, it says he walks in, he sits down at the table, it says he, he says he takes the bread, breaks it in half, gives thanks, and then in an instant, their eyes were opened. What? Am I the only one that thinks that's the weirdest thing in the world, right? So we got Jesus over here being personal Beth Moore Bible study partner, just giving them all the text, all the text, here you go, fill in the blank, fill in the blank, whatever it is, right? Nothing happens. Jesus takes a piece of bread and rips it in half, ah, right? Like, let's sit in the gravity of that for a second, right? Which, by the way, I love that it has to do with food. Amen. Chipotle, Chick-fil-A. Okay, just with me. Um, mm-hmm. Yes. Amen. I mean that guac, though. Are you with me? Okay. Um, but you see, right, that he breaks the bread in half, he gives thanks, and in an instant their eyes were opened. Now what's beautiful about that story, and what I think are we trying, what is Luke trying to tell us in that story? Might that first example but be what we actually think our kind of dream vision of Christianity is, is it not? So many of us, if only God could show up in the room, if only God could show up in my room, take away all my doubts, failures, and hurt, and all these different things, and just give me all the answers, then I'd be okay, right? But what does Jesus really want with us? Jesus says, no, 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 I don't want to just give you a bunch of the facts so then you can actually leave and not need me anymore. What I actually want to do and my dream and vision for this whole thing is that you would sit at the table with me. See, one represents mental assent and getting all the facts. The other one says, I want to sit with my creator. I want to know him. I want to share a meal with him. I want to commune with him. And I think that's a beautiful and amazing story. Why? Because a lot of us, the question we have to wrestle with is, especially at a Christian university, especially, do you just want the right answers from Jesus or do you want to sit at the table with Jesus? They're two different things. You have a choice, but they're two different things. And this is the one where joy is at. This is the one where healing's at. This is the one where wholeness is at. And so might... No matter where you're at, might we be people that instead of just trying to, you know, study more or do all this more, which you can do, but don't let that self terminate. Might we be people who want to know more about Jesus? Because being in his presence, reaching out and touching him, sharing a meal with Jesus, being in communion with him, that's where true healing is. And that's what I want to leave you guys with. Don't leave this place getting a bunch of facts. Leave this place knowing Jesus more and finding that healing. And so might it be that the very question he asked in the very beginning, where are you? Might you answer that with saying, I'm sitting at the table with you. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. We thank you for the text. We thank you for your scripture. We thank you 
God that from the very beginning of time we have a picture, we're not left guessing, we have a picture that you are a God who calls, you're a God who comes after, you're a God who says, where are you? God, I know there's hard parts in this room. I know there's shame and guilt, but that is not your voice. That is not the truth coming from the beginning. And so might we be people who take that to you and find that healing. Listen to your voice and sit at the table with you. So in your name we pray, amen.